we need to start. Yeah. Welcome everybody um, to the second seminar of the Australian National University Centre for Early Modern Studies. I can see here that we have uh, people rolling in, um, participants rolling in, so I, I might just give uh, one or two minutes just to allow people to arrive. I think we'd better make a start. I'm, I'm keen to see these numbers ticking up. But as I say, welcome to the second seminar of the Australian National University Centre for Early Modern Studies. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Robert Wellington, a senior lecturer in art history and art theory at ANU. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ANU campus is on the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Nyambri people. And I pay my res profound respects to their elders past and present. I would like to extend especially warm greetings to any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations people joining us today. And I'm coming to you from beautiful Yuan country, which is on the New South Wales South Coast. And I encourage you all to take a moment to reflect on whose country you are on and to acknowledge the extraordinary contribution that Indigenous people have made to taking care of those lands. A little housekeeping uh, before I introduce our speaker. We have allowed time for questions and discussion uh, after the talk and we're using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and we will encourage you as our presenter is speaking uh, to enter your questions into the Q&A as they occur to you throughout the talk and then we can address those um, when the presentation has finished. We're not using the chat function this time so uh, please direct all of your questions through the Q&A. We're recording the seminar today and we're going to, we're going to share the link uh, to everybody who's registered with Eventbrite. So if you have any friends or colleagues uh, who couldn't come along today but um, are very interested in this talk, um, you'll be able to share that link with them. So uh, we hope that you uh, will, will be very uh, uh, pleased to do so. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Robbie Richardson who recently joined the English department at Princeton University, I think it was about a year ago. Uh, and his, uh, but as his Twitter handle, London Micmac attests, Robbie was until recently based in the UK, where he taught at the University of Kent in Canterbury in Paris, which informed his interdisciplinary research looking at the interactions between indigenous and European cultures. Robbie is the ideal speaker for our interdisciplinary center for early modern studies, as his interests include indigenous studies, art and material culture, the history of museums and collecting, uh, and the literature of empire. He is a member of the Pabino or Mi'kmaq First Nation of New Brunswick, Canada. And for me, uh, his afterword beyond gestural politics for the indigenous 18th century special issue of eight, the, the journal 18th century fiction that he recently co-edited, demonstrates his leadership in anti-colonial approaches to early modern studies. In that piece, Robbie reminds us uh, that a recent interest in decolonizing the academy has done little to change the real material conditions of First Nations people. And in that spirit, I encourage you to seek out businesses run by and charities that support First Nations people in your local area. Robbie's excellent first book, The Savage and Modern Self, North American Indians in 18th Century British Literature and Culture, published by the University of Toronto Press in 2018, examines the representations of North American, quote, Indians in novels, poetry, captivity narratives, plays, and material culture from 18th century Britain. It argues that depictions of 
Indians in British literature were used to critique and articulate evolving ideas about consumerism, colonialism, Britishness, and ultimately the modern self over the course of that century. And I do recommend this book to you unreservedly. Today, Robbie is very generously sharing material from his next book project, which looks at the history of indigenous objects from the Americas and South Pacific in Europe up to 1800, and the ways in which these materials and the epistemologies they represented informed primarily British understandings of their own past and present. His talk today is titled, The Souls of Departed Utensils, Death and Indigenous Material Culture in 18th Century Britain. And although we can't see you all here on the screen, I know you will join me in warmly welcoming our speaker, Robbie Richardson. So over to you now, Robbie, I invite you to share your screen with us. Okay. All right, is that shared? It is. Perfect. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Robert, and thank you for everyone uh, inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, this is, uh, well, I'll get to it, but this is very much um, new material that I'm presenting. So uh, some of it might work and some of it might not. So this talk uh, is a preliminary part of my larger project on the history of the European collecting of indigenous objects from the Americas and Oceania up to the beginning of the 19th century. In this work, I look to locate indigenous knowledge and belief through collected material culture to understand how it was learned, appropriated, or disavowed by Europeans. And while I have encountered and written about colonial violence and erasure in this work, I haven't figured out a way to discuss the darkest aspect of museum collecting, the gathering of the bones of people from around the world, victims of enslavement, slaughter, settler colonialism, and of course, theft and looting. This is a painful legacy for indigenous people around the world, and one which implicates many museums and universities, including my own. In 1990, the United States passed the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA. And since that time, over 50,000 individual human remains, 1.2 million associated funerary objects, 219,000 unassociated funerary objects, 5,000 sacred objects, over 8,000 objects of cultural patrimony, and 1,600 objects, both sacred and patrimonial, have been repatriated. This is just to give a sense of the scale of the collecting of indigenous death across the world. Given these numbers are in the US only and do not include the many more objects and bodies still in collections, both here in the US um, and around the world. Um, the, additionally, still in America, there's uh, an estimated 116,000 indigenous bodies across various American museums and universities. Um, and Europe, it's estimated, collected 500,000 North American indigenous uh, individuals beginning in the late 19th century. So this story of accumulation of bones and body parts can, of course, be told in part through the rise of the disciplines of institutions and of the museum in particular, and the intersections of colonial power and knowledge as embodied in the collection and display of indigenous artifacts. But it's worth pointing out that the vast majority of both North American and Australian Indigenous bones were collected between 1860 and 1920, corresponding with both the rise of race science and anthropology as a discipline. As such, this falls somewhat outside my period of focus. But uh, what I want to offer here is both a prehistory of this tragic drive and of the necropolitics that inform it as well as a consideration of ideas about death itself in the period and how it becomes entangled and almost synonymous with British ideas of indigeneity. At the same time, I want to seriously consider the indigenous funerary practices which are written into British texts and consider them not elegiacally, as they would be by European writers, but as examples of survivance and a radical hope for future generations. <clears throat> 
In this case, I look to my own people, the Mi'kmaq. I refuse to reinscribe settler colonial myths of death and disappearance or of tragedy and victimhood. I haven't yet definitively mapped out the constellations, so please uh, take what I'm about to present uh, in the spirit of a seminar and uh, as a far from complete project or paper. It's a constellation. In Act Two, Scene Two of Shakespeare's The Tempest, written in 1610, Trinculo declares upon seeing Caliban, were I in England now, as once I was, and had but this fish painted, not a holiday fool there, but would give a piece of silver. There would this monster make a man. Any strange beast there makes a man. When they will not give a doit to relieve a lame beggar, they will lay out 10 to see a dead Indian. In this instance, Shakespeare is not, of course, celebrating the British tendency toward dehumanizing exoticism. He's mocking both the lack of social responsibility and the insatiable curiosity for new world things, which seems to go hand in hand. I'm interested, however, in the specificity of this reference. How common was the display of dead Indians? And what might this tell us about the then nascent collecting of objects from the new world? Walter Raleigh brought around 20 indigenous people to the Americas from the other Americas to Britain between 1584 and 1618, mostly to learn Christianity and English and to serve as interpreters, some of whom died, most of whom returned home. The records are unclear. Though we know the last person that Raleigh brought to Britain, an indigenous man from Guyana, outlived him and witnessed the adventurer's beheading in October of 1618, a decidedly different kind of spectacle involving a dead body. A bit earlier, John White's 1585 watercolors of Algonquian life and death in Virginia would be reprinted as engravings by Theodore de Bry in Thomas Harriet's book, A Brief and true report of the newfound land of Virginia in 1590. This depiction of an ossuary temple where their leaders' bodies were dried and kept safe provided another kind of spectacle, but this time for the learned. But historians of earlier generations have taken Shakespeare's reference to be to one of the several Inuit that Martin Frobisher brought to England in the late 16th century. In 1576, one unknown Inuk man died soon after arrival. His body was embalmed under the pretense of it being eventually returned to his people before it was eventually buried at St. Olaf's London. Perhaps it was displayed before internment. Perhaps Shakespeare saw it. A year later, Martin Frobisher brought three more Inuit uh, against their will. A man named Calico, who died soon after arriving at Bristol. A woman named Arnok, who died days later, leaving behind her infant son, Nutak, who would also die, but in London. And like the earlier Inuk man, he was buried at St. Olaf's. Thus, these early captives and others like them were brought to Europe as curiosities, and their bones of little scientific interest at this stage were collected in the undifferentiated mass of the churchyard. 100 years after The Tempest was written, the so-called four Indian kings arrived in London. These representatives of the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois Confederacy, who arrived to petition Queen Anne for aid in 1710, are frequently discussed and known to scholars of the period. I can't really get away from them, given my subject matter, so they come up a lot for me. They were painted in widely circulated images, and they also left behind a number of items including moccasins, a tump line, and a ceremonial purging stick, all of which survive in Britain, in the British Museum, and in a collection in Yorkshire. Addison and Steele's spectator number 50 took the occasion of the king's visit to satirize the English in a well-known letter supposedly written by one of the Indian kings. Swift jealously admired the piece and claimed to have come up with the premise in which the Indian kings encounter London life and describe it from their unpretentious and unaffected perspective. As such, they mock the pretensions of fashion, politeness, and party politics through the figure of the natural man, or as that would be later known, the noble savage. Less well known is a subsequent article by Addison in Spectator 56 in 1711, 
It begins, the Americans believe that all creatures have souls, not only men and women, but brutes, vegetables, nay, even the most inanimate things as stalks and stones. For this reason, they always place by the corpse of their dead friend a bow and arrows, that he may make use of the souls of them in the other world, as he did of their wooden bodies in this. While this may seem absurd to the rational faith of the Enlightenment, Ang the Enlightenment Anglican, Addison notes, our European philosophers have maintained several notions altogether as improbable. He points out, among other, uh, other examples, that the alchemist Albertus Magnus observed the effects of fire on a lodestone, which destroyed its magnetic virtues, and watched a certain blue vapor arise from it, which he took to be the, quote, substantial form, that is, in our West Indian phrase, the soul of the lodestone. The essay continues that there is a widespread tradition among North American indigenous people that, quote, one of their countrymen descended in a vision to the underworld. To find out more, he prevailed upon one of the interpreters of the Indian kings to inquire of them, if possible, what tradition they have among them of this manner. Addison's source for this observation and the sentimental story that follows it about a native man named Mariton going to the land of souls to retrieve his beloved Yaratilda are unclear. Editors in the following centuries assumed that Addison was referring to the immaterialism of his good friend, Bishop Barclay. I believe, however, that his source is the Jesuit relations, the 17th century journals of French missionaries among the indigenous nations of Eastern North America. This version, this Orpheus myth in North American indigenous accounts would appear across native nations with the rise of ethnography in the 19th century. But it first appears in Brebeuf's account of the Huron in 1636, and later in Lafitau and then Leclerc's accounts of their time among the Mi'kmaq. <clears throat> John Locke owned Christian Leclerc's Nouvelle Relation de la Gaspe from 1691, and notes in his surviving copy indicate, in Sarah Rivett's words, that he viewed the text, quote, as a source of ethnographic information relevant to contemporary debates about matter and spirit. Given Addison's admiration of Locke and deep familiarity with his thought, it is unsurprising that he too would find fodder for philosophical speculation in the Jesuit accounts. Compare Leclerc's account of the Mi'kmaq to Addison's words for the London coffee houses. Our Gaspesians, which was the favored name of the Mi'kmaq from the Jesuit, in common with all the other Indians of New France, have believed up to the present that there is in every thing, even in such as are inanimate, a particular spirit which follows deceased persons into the other world in order to render them as much service after death as these had received therefrom during life. He continues, the Indians believe souls are immortal and that in everything of which they made use, such as canoes, snowshoes, bows, arrows, and other things, there is a particular spirit which would always accompany after death the one who made use thereof during life. And it is actually for this reason and in this foolish fancy that they bury with deceased persons everything which these possessed while on the earth. In the belief that each article in particular renders them the same service in the land of souls that it, uh, that it did to its owner when alive. Leclerc worried uh, that the greatest obstacle to the Mi'kmaq embracing the true Christian faith is their way of attributing power and a soul to all things, not only to animals, but also plants and material objects. Yet at the same time, this story revealed a belief in the immortality of the soul, which perhaps the missionary could work with. In one of the Mi'kmaq versions of the story of Marathon, the man is in search of his son, not a lover, and returns to the land of the living from the land of souls with corn and tobacco, thus explaining their origins and the origin of seeds. To the dead ancestors, in other words, we are the future. We owe the future. In Mi'kmaq ontology, the universe is filled with an animating spirit called Mindu, M-N-T-O, sorry, M-N-T-U. Megan Howey notes that for the Mi'kmaq, objects were not only allowed, but expected to possess purposeful agency. It seems as though Addison's spectator evokes one of our cultural practices and our relational ontology in the center of the emergent public sphere. By this time in 1711, 
the Mi'kmaq had grown accustomed to death and unbearable grief. During the 16th century, we lost 75% of our population to foreign disease, and these losses continued in the 17th century. It's estimated that 70% of those who died were our children, and due to the sustained contact with Europeans, we also lost most of our leaders. We searched for new ways to imagine the future in the face of societal collapse and profound transcultural change. Because burial became such a common event, it too began to change with this new reality. And our dead had to be prepared for a different future alongside us. Prior to European invasion, there were relatively few durable grave goods buried alongside Mi'kmaq people. Yet after invasion, and especially during the periods of highest loss, they increased exponentially. This included many items of European manufacture. The most popular grave goods were kettles, copper pots traded by Europeans. Copper was already a highly charged and valuable material for Wabanaki and other nations, but European copper proved even more so. Europeans long assumed this is a kind of technological determinism and indigenous nations acculturated to this more durable cookware. But in fact, the kettle was not really used for its utilitarian function, and most native nations continued to use their earthenware pots. But it was charged with the power to make the spirit world more accommodating. The demand for kettles was driven by their incorporation into symbolically, ceremonially, and socially charged activities, especially burials and rituals of the dead. This was the case among other nations too, and the Huron-Wendat used copper petals in their feasts of the dead, in which ancestors were exhumed, cleaned, and reburied with goods such as kettles. In Mi'kma'ki, the homeland of the Mi'kmaq, which is now the Maritime Provinces in Canada, there are numerous sites of so-called copper, copper kettle burials, which date from 1500 to 1630. The Mi'kmaq told Father Leclerc that kettles were included in the graves of dead kin to, quote, bear him company and do him service in the land of souls. The French were unhappy with this practice, often demanding that Mi'kmaq stop burying their trade goods. In the 17th century account of Nicolas Denis, Jesuits forced some Mi'kmaq to open a grave to show them their waste. But a native man explained, the dead have need of kettles, since it is among us a utensil of new introduction and with which the other world cannot yet be furnished. Do you indeed, indeed see, said he, rapping again upon the kettle, that it has no longer any sound, and that it no longer says a word, because its spirit has abandoned it to go be of use in the other world to the dead man to whom we have given it. Sometimes kettles were perforated, perhaps to release their souls, or perhaps to make new kettles look old but some remained wholly intact. In all cases, the kettles were placed upside down in burial. This marks them as unusable, but also as Howie notes, indicates a world turned upside down, overturned and upside down. Perhaps the most compelling thing that copper kettles and other European goods indicate is that the other world, the land of souls, is inaccessible to Europeans. The buried and overturned kettle prepares our ancestors for the future. Walter Benjamin perhaps captures this worldview best in his sixth thesis on the philosophy of history. Only that historian will have the gift of fanning the spark of hope in the past, who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins, and the enemy has not ceased to be victorious. Gluskap is an important cultural figure in Mi'kmaq myth. He's not the creator, but exists in the fourth level of creation. He is both hero and trickster. In several myths, Gluskap prophesizes the coming of Europeans. There are also a number of stories about his kettle. In one version, Gluskap decides to abandon the Mi'kmaq because he, quote, was not able to cope with the white invaders who came into his domain. He tells the Mi'kmaq people, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to a place where I can never be reached by a white man. He turns his kettle upside down and departs, and his upside down kettle became an island, Utiamal, Kluskap's kettle, or Spencer's Island in Nova Scotia. He must invert his kettle to escape the white man. 
as how he notes, even as the Mi'kmaq adapted to the context of contact with Europeans, they still envisioned and actively planned for an exclusively indigenous afterworld. This became written into the landscape, which teaches us all things. Perhaps the greatest and certainly most well-known British media meditation on death in the 18th century is Thomas Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard from 1750, in which a visitor to a rural English churchyard reflects on the unhonored dead, on the rude forefathers whose humble existence means they are too soon forgotten by the living and are absent from the annals of the nation. After speculating on who they might have been, were they not subject to chill penury, on all those mute Miltons, guiltless Cromwells. The speaker of Gray's poem declares, yet even these bones from insult to protect, some frail memorial still erected nigh, with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculptured, sculptor, sculpture deck implores the passing tribute of a sigh. Gray ushered in a new kind of sympathetic identification with the dead in Britain, as well as a new way of thinking about history. As Sarah Beth Grant argues, the poem seeks to answer the question, if great men no longer form the basis of writing history, then who becomes the subject of historical inquiry? Who possesses historical agency? And how is historical consciousness written? Or to put it differently, Esther Shore suggests the elegy expresses an idealized relationship to the dead, which seeks to enlarge the idea of a cultural inheritance beyond class and local boundaries. But from my perspective, a frail memorial and a passing sigh hardly seem the stuff of ancestral debt and repayment. Nonetheless, this poem would become for a variety of reasons, one of the most influential for the next 75 years, as sympathy became synonymous with moral virtue. At the same time, the individual self became the border of existence. In 1787, colonial American writer Philip Furneaux's poem, lines occasioned by a visit to an old Indian burying ground, merges Gray's encounter with the dead with the earlier depictions of indigenous funerary practices. Oh, whoops. <clears throat> but while in Gray's churchyard, his rude forefathers sleep, as Max Cavage notes, the dead Indians that Freneau encounters are restless. In death, as in life, they seem to lack a settled relation to the land, a shortcoming conventionally ascribed to Indians and used as legal justification for their dispossession. The poem begins, in spite, in spite of all the learned have said, I still my old opinion keep. The posture that we give the dead points out the soul's eternal sleep. Not so the ancients of these lands, the Indian, when from life released, again is seated with his friends and shares again the joyous feast. His imaged birds and painted bowl and venison for a journey dressed bespeak the nature of the soul, activity that knows no rest. Observing the Indian's burial mound, Furneaux explains, they do not lie, here they sit. Thus with their grave goods and their seated posture, the Indians will forever hunt the shades of deer as Marathon witnesses in the Spectator article in the Land of Souls. And for no ends, and long shall timorous, timorous fancy see the painted chief and pointed spear, and reason's self shall bow, bow the knee to shadows and delusions here. I don't think that Freneau is quite as thoroughly embracing the myth of the dying Indian as would be seen in subsequent romantic poetry, but he is both appropriating and disavowing indigeneity and what would become a signature move in American culture. The Indian, as Sunquist suggests, in Freneau is turned into a ruin in both aesthetic and moral terms. I would suggest this is partly enabled by Freneau's uncertainty over grave goods, over the material culture of death and the granting of souls to objects and beings. Yet it's worth pointing out that Freneau does urge the reader Thou stranger, thou shalt come this way, no fraud upon the dead commit, perhaps addressing the plundering of indigenous graves and grave goods that was already then widespread. 
1760, 10 years after his elegy and nearly 30 years before Furneaux's revision of it into settler colonial national myth, Thomas Gray wrote a letter to Thomas Wharton, fellow poet of graveyards and melancholy. This was shortly after the much memorialized death of General James Wolfe in Quebec, famously painted, of course, by Benjamin West in 1770. Presumably, Gray had not yet heard the story that Wolfe, before leading his forces into battle and to ultimately his own demise, recited the elegy and declared, quote, now, gentlemen, I would prefer being the author of that poem to the glory of beating the French tomorrow. I mean, probably not a true story, but. Following Wolfe's death, leadership fell to George Townsend, first Marquis Townsend, noted nemesis to Wolfe, whose well-known animosity to the great man made it hard to return to Britain triumphantly. This is the initial topic of Gray's letter. Wolf's death, Townsend taking over, which soon shifts. Wolf writes, General Townsend has brought home an Indian boy with him, designed for Lord Sackville, but he did not choose to take him, who goes about in his own dress and is brought into the room to divert his company. The general after dinner one day had been showing them a box of scalps and some Indian arms and utensils. When they were gone, the boy got the box and found a scalp, which he knew by the hair belonged to one of his own nation. He grew into a sudden fury, though but 11 years old, and catching up one of the scalping knives, made at his master with intention to murder him, who in his surprise hardly knew how to avoid him, and by laying open his breast, making signs, and with a few words of French jargon that the boy understood, at last, with much difficulty, pacified him. The first rejoicing night, he was terribly frighted and thought the bonfire was made for him and that they were going to torture and devour him. He is mighty fine. He is mighty fond of venison, blood raw. And once they caught him flourishing his knife over a dog that lay asleep by the fire because, he said, it was bon manger. It's hard to reconcile Gray's sympathy for the unsung village dead with his profound lack of sympathy for this 11-year-old indigenous boy, enslaved and terrified at an English estate. George Townsend, his captor, was a caricaturist in addition to being a politician military officer. And while on campaign in Canada, he drew several images of Odawa people. The images of fierce yet skulking Indians captures, as Douglas Fordham suggests, curiosity mixed with fear and loathing. The young boy was probably right to fear his master. Ultimately, his fate is unknown. This letter, Gray's letter, contains all that we know about him. At the same time, Townsend's brother Roger had been killed by a cannonball in North America, and the family arranged for him to be memorialized in Westminster Abbey. An earlier national competition had requested submissions for a design of Wolfe's monument, and the Townsend family selected one of the competition's losers, noted 18th century architect Robert Adam, to design the monument for their son and brother. Adam, it seems, repurposed his classical design for Wolfe, and then eventually at a late stage, added to his design two Indian figures holding up the monument. There's nothing in the Abbey quite like this. When I look at this, I wonder who was the model for Adam's drawing and for the sculptures. It's hard not to strongly suspect that it was the, this young terrified Odawa boy brought to a foreign land against his will and then carved into stone like a living grave good. We can also see traces of Townsend's own pathological caricatures in their form and in the objects that adorn them. These objects, Fordham suggests, must have been carved from the actual objects in Townsend's collection. The same Indian arms and utensils the boy would rifle through one fearful day before finding a scalp. In his book, Bone Rooms, Samuel Redmond suggests, once the body becomes an object, it became a tool 
in scientific study and display. End quote. But what if it isn't just science, but a structure of feeling that turns the body into an object? Those who deserve sympathy and those who are outside its bounds are the difference between body as sacred and body as specimen. It's no coincidence, of course, that criminals' bodies in the 18th century were routinely given to anatomists. And it seems that the more syst uh, systematic collection of indigenous bones begins in the 1760s, once theories of sympathy, as in Adam Smith, insisted that indigenous people simply don't have the capacity to feel the same way that Europeans do. In addition, through poetry such as Freneau and the widespread popularity of the Indian death song as a genre among proto-romantic and romantic poets, Indian death became aestheticized and naturalized, an inevitable, if somewhat tragic, loss. The Scottish surgeon John Hunter became the most notorious bone collector in the 18th century and sought out as many specimens as he could find from around the world in his study of human variation. He was painted in 1786 by Joshua Reynolds. And in the open book behind him, there is the skull of a European beside that of an indigenous Australian. It's noteworthy that this is before the first living indigenous Australian would even visit Britain when the Euroman Benelong arrived in 1793 and stayed for two years. Unlike indigenous North Americans, the bones of indigenous Australians were collected almost from the moment of first contact. And while Hunter may have been the most notorious collector, it was the naturalist Joseph Banks who was the most productive broker for those who wanted bones. Already a prodigious collector of flora and fauna, as well as indigenous material culture, Banks found himself to be the top patron of foreign anatomy. There are even instances of him arranging for graves to be dug up around the world for keen collectors, such as the early race scientist and good friend, Johann Blumenbach. In one case, Blumenbach desperately wanted the skull of a Carib chief before they disappeared as a people. But Banks warned, quote, their burial places are not easily found and an attempt to disturb them is looked upon as the greatest of crimes. But through the Scottish botanist Alexander Anderson, Banks procures the skull for his friend. And as Paul Turnbull notes, this skull is one of the earliest records of the means by which indigenous human remains were commonly acquired for Western scientists until well into the 20th century. Blumenbach called his collection of skulls in Göttingen his Golgotha. And in his 1795 work on the natural variety of mankind, he sincerely addressed Banks, quote, for many years, have you spared neither pains nor expense to enrich my collection of the skulls of different nations with those specimens I was so anxious above all to obtain? If everything was sacred in its own way for indigenous people and animated by spirit, it's as if nothing was sacred for banks, at least not in indigenous worlds. Skulls and spears were just as worthy of collection. In many ways, the modern museum would inherit this same disenchantment. In 1773, uh, I'm winding up here shortly. In 1773, a group of Inuit again visited England, among the first since the tragic visits by their kin almost 200 years later. Their host, the trader George Cartwright, took them to none other than John Hunter's London home at Leicester Square for dinner. One of the Inuit, a Tuyak, who was believed to be a holy man, wandered off to use the toilet when he came across a room of specimens, which contained, in Cartwright's words, a glass case containing many human bones. What follows is from Cartwright's account. Look there, says he, with more horror and consternation in his countenance than I ever beheld in that man before. Are these the bones of Eskimo, whom Mr. Hunter has killed and eaten? Are we to be killed? Will he eat us and put our bones there? As the whole company followed us, the other Indians had also taken the alarm before the old priest had finished his inter interrogation. Nor did any of them seem more at ease by the rest of us breaking out into a sudden and hearty laugh till I explained to them, those were the bones of our own people who had been executed for certain crimes committed by them and were preserved there that Mr. Hunter might better know how to set those of the living 
in case any of them should chance to be broken, which often happened in so populous a country. They were then perfectly satisfied and approved of the practice, but At Atuyark's nerves had received too great a shock to enable him to resume his usual tranquility. This anecdote would often be reprinted in humorous accounts of London throughout the following century. What it does not mention is that all of the Inuit would develop smallpox and die there, except for Kobvik, who would bring the disease back to her community and devastate it before dying from it. And a few years later, not Hunter, but Blumenbach would boast of those, quote, wonderfully worn teeth in two Eskimo skulls, which have lately come to me and lists among his rarities Ituyak, an Eskimo magician brought to London in 1773 from the coast of Labrador, and an Eskimo woman by name Kobik, which in the language of those barbarians means a blind bear. Like the unnamed boy at Townsend Estate, Townsend's estate, the Inuit witnessed their own dehumanization in this elite man's home and saw their fate in a world that only wanted them as objects or relics without souls. So I wound up where I started with the European desire to see dead Indians. For indigenous people, this is the most visible and pressing legacy to correct. Bones, more than material culture, reveal the theft of our past, of our ancestors, and of our future. As Ashil Mbembe writes about skeletons and necropolitics, albeit in a different context, what is striking is the tension between the petrification of bones and their strange coolness on one hand, and on the other, their stubborn will to mean, to signify something. And yet the return of these willful bones is not enough, does not mean enough. A couple of years ago, I was in Edinburgh, just after the Scottish National Museum returned two Beotuk skulls to Canada, which had been stolen from a grave along with ceremonial objects by William Epps Cormac in 1827. These were two of the last Beotuk people who by 1829 were wiped out by European invasion and disease. Yet the other objects buried alongside the skulls, the departed utensils, if you will, which were also plundered from the grave, were not returned and still remain in Edinburgh. Further, the bones were not buried upon repatriation, as several Mi'kmaq elders desired, but rather sent to another non-Indigenous museum in Canada, where they are still. As long as our remains sit in boxes and our sacred objects sit lifeless under glass far from home, the future our ancestors were promised has yet to arrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robbie, for that incredibly powerful and moving talk and of course a, a, a history of trauma that you're bringing up there which is um, has very pressing and urgent needs for address. Um, we're getting a couple of um, comments here in the Q&A just to remind everybody before we start addressing these questions please put your questions for Robbie uh, in the Q&A you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you would prefer to, to say your question live uh, we can uh, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you and then we'll be able to hear you but sadly not see you with this webinar format. So uh, Robbie I think you can see the Q&A here we'll start with a question from uh, Talia Schaeffer Thank you for this fascinating and moving talk. It made me think about the 19th century fetishization of white women's dead bodies. Sarah Bernard posing in a coffin, women's bodies displayed publicly in the Paris morgue, the fetishized foot in H. Ryder Haggard's She. Uh, this seems to trouble the division between subject and object that you bring up. The women are definitely objectified, but one thing I notice is that the indigenous remains are bone, whereas the women's remains are flesh. Does that distinction matter for how we read or how they understood remains? The skull in the museum versus the white face on the slab of the morgue, the bones versus the bodies. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, I think that distinction does matter. Um, I haven't really thought too much about it in terms of, um, um, sort of collection itself, but obviously there's a certain, a certain kind of embodiment that comes with, uh, with flesh, with, with public dissection, with um, public display that is different from the bone, which then, which becomes this sort of more obviously undifferentiated um, sort of object, if that makes sense. Mm 
but yeah, that's that's a great question. There's definitely more to say about that. We have a couple of more questions in the Q and A, but I noticed that uh, Christina Jarrett's hand is raised. I, I, I perhaps Christina would like to pose her question if we can unmute. Christina, have you lowered your hand? Christina, I think we can hear you. I said, sorry, that was a mistake. There we are, sorry, we've just got you, Christina, oh, there thank we you. <laughs> sorry, that was a mistake, my bad, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Christina. Sorry about that. Okay, we'll move on to uh, Kate Fulliger's question here in the chat. And Kate says, beautiful presentation, Robbie. Uh, thank you. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on how you have found the experience of comparing Native Amer American and Oceanian examples. Um, so that's part one. And the second question, uh, also uh, Kate wonders um, more about a more crass materialistic argument that suggests that burial goods also sometimes represent societies that seek to forestall the build-up of economic uh, inequality, an argument given to explain Cherokee bur burial goods, um, she believes. Um, yeah, I mean, for the, for the first part, um, as I kind of mentioned, one of the things I'm sort of trying to think through is that um, for Indigenous Australian people, their bodies were targeted for collection from the very beginning, right? And that's and that's quite different from from North America, despite sort of me sort of tra tracing the genealogy of the desire to see the dead Indian or whatever. But um, but yeah, so so as a result, um, I mean that's obviously different. That kind of and also the fact that their remains appeared before they themselves appeared. Um, so there's this kind of like. Um, I guess, built in objectification to that, um, which ties them more to ob objects and material culture even than the native North American people. But again, it's something I'm sort of still thinking through. I don't really, um, I don't really know about, enough about the, the, the collection of indigenous Australian remains just yet. And for the second part, um, yeah, uh, I, I was worried that somebody would ask because I, it, my, um, my idea of grave goods is, is, shall we say, a little bit under theorized at this point. Um, and I am interested in sort of ideas about, um, or not interested in, but actually pursuing, uh, you know, this ideas of the performance of waste and, um, and sort of excess and all that stuff. Um, and I, I think I tried to be a bit specific about uh, with the Mi'kmaq kettles, because I think that might be uh, sort of unique, uh, unique scenario. Um, but yeah, I need to look into more uh, other examples to see that they can kind of hold up in that same way. But thank you, Kate. It's a great question. Uh, we have uh, now another question from Hilary Howes. Thank you for this very powerful presentation. Are you able to explain why the Bayotuk ancestral remains you mentioned have not been reburied as their traditional owners wanted? Are there plans for this to happen? Yeah, um, it's quite remarkable that um, Canada does not have any, as far as I know, legislation that's comparable to NAGPRA that exists in the States. Um, and so uh, the repatriation effort itself was really complicated because for things to come from European museums, they demand that uh, people show um, like living relations. Of course, the Bayotak don't have any living relations because they were wiped out. Um, so that in and of itself is complicated. And then I think the same issue is happening in Canada, that um, there just isn't an agreement about where they should go. And I know that uh, there are actually several Indigenous nations that are involved in sort of dealing what, with what happens to it next. Um, like I think... Uh, so maybe Northern Cree. Anyway, there's another. There's other nations besides the Mi'kmaq that are involved in uh, in in dealing with that. So I, I mean, I think that they will be eventually buried, but there's just so many because there's no legislation in place for what to do with these human remains. They just haven't haven't figured it out. I noticed that Kate has just commented here. Uh, yes, I thought the kettle showed that burial goods 
are more often uh, often more than just an, an anti-inequality move. So she's just responding ah, to that one. Great. <laughs> um, thank you, Kate. Uh, our next question is from Jane Simpson. Uh, is it fair to say that many European societies moved from banning dissection of bodies to a view that promoted the practice of giving one's body to science for dissection and for bones to go to an, an anatomy museum? And that this led to the view that uh, unenlightened, we'll put quotes around that, people didn't realise the value of their bodies for science. And so to the failure to recognise um, the destructiveness of not um, of, uh, apparently for another person's customs of honouring the dead. Yeah, I think that's probably fair to say. Certainly in the 19th century uh, case, um, you know, you should, you should give your body to science because you're so interesting to science. Um, yeah, I think that's true. But of course, I think that the reason, um, the reason for the collecting of European bones versus indigenous bones were very different. Uh, if we look at Blumenbach, who was, as I mentioned, a, a race scientist who was trying to basically sort of um, put into material practice his idea that, that people besides Europeans were less evolved. So, um, so, you know, they were used to sort of fuel race science, whereas collecting a European body and studying that is, is, is quite a different, a different matter. And I, I, would, I would argue that I think the collection of indigenous bodies is more tied to that sort of museum heritage, whereas the other one is more tied to kind of medical science as such. Uh, thanks, Robbie. Uh, Lucy Neve has more of a comment than a question, she says here, and thank you for the fantastic presentation. Um, Lucy's wondering if you know of the work by Martin Thomas and Beatrice Bijon, who made a film about repatriating the bones of the Gun Balanya people. The film's called Etched in Bone, and Martin Thomas and Beatrice Bijon are at King's. I did not, thank you. Write that down. Excellent. Thank you. For, thank you, uh, Lucy, for that to comment. That's great. Very helpful. Uh, next question uh, by Terry Hull. Fascinating presentation, Robbie, says Terry. What are the legal barriers to First Nations efforts to repatriate objects in museums and university collections? What efforts are in train to gather First Nations to promote international legal reform? Um, well, I, th I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, in, in Canada, there, there isn't really any legislation as far as I know. So there isn't any real recourse. Um, and you have to then therefore rely on uh, the sort of the, the good graces of museums, which um, typically is, is not going to happen if you want to repatriate something, particularly from, say, for example, the British Museum. Um, so, so efforts tend to be kind of on a nation by nation basis as an indigenous nation by indigenous nation um, in, in Canada. In the States it's different because then there is, there is NAGPRA within that. Uh, although um, surprising countries are like, I've heard that Germany is one of the hardest countries to get things back from, which you wouldn't necessarily expect, but because of their internal, because it's so sort of dedicated to kind of like the history of science, um, you know, it's really, really hard to get, like, for example, they have a lot of Aboriginal Australian remains there, um, as do, and Aboriginal Canadian ones too, so. I note here, before we move on to our next question, that Hilary House has a response to Jane Simpson's question. Um, uh, she would recommend Helen MacDonald's book, Possessing the Dead, in which she points out that the most, that, that uh, most British anatomists did not donate their own bodies or the bodies of their loved ones to science. Instead, they went to great lengths to ensure a decent burial for them. So that's a very interesting comment then from Hilary. Uh, <laughs> our next question from Justina Miskiewicz. Uh, thank you for this very moving talk, Justina says. The American Association of Physical Anthropologists recently changed its name to the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. This was an effort to distance itself from the early 20th century racist tendencies of physical, quote, anthropology. They are also incorporating various other guidelines and policies, uh, heading towards the decolonization of anthropological approaches to the study of human skeletal remains uh, applicable globally. However, a large number of uh, skeletal collections from the early 20th century accrued unethically are still regularly used in anthropological research. 
with ethics clearances and approvals from relevant institutions. Do you have any general thoughts, Robbie, on the future of anthropological approaches to human skeletal remains? <clears throat> hmm. I mean, that's uh, fraught, obviously. Uh, I, I mean, my general sense is that, um, that if a nation wants their people back, they should get them back. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not a scientist, so <laughs> I'm an indigenous person, not a scientist. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, difficult questions there. Um, I know Hil Hilary House has a, a comment here about Germany. Um, Germany until recently, oh. uh, and that may have been accurate, but there has been enormous revolution in recent years, since approximately 2011, and great many re uh, repatriations of ancestral remains have taken place. Uh, as well as some of uh, some returns of cultural material. However, it does vary between institutions. Most are regulated at the state level and there's currently no national legislation compelling repatriation. So right. these things right. are yeah, no, I changing. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like I did, I did read like a fairly recent article, definitely post 2011, where it was talking about, um, I can't remember which sort of Australian First Nation it was, but they were finding it really difficult to navigate um, I don't know which which uh, institution or state it was in, but it was, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question here from Gilda Andrews. Um, Gilda says, do copper kettles feature in any way within Indigenous Canadian museums, Bobby? It would be interesting to consider how these objects might be valued or represented in a native museum context. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think um, most of the ones that I'm aware of from the, I, I think there's like a dozen or so that are from the copper kettle burials in, in the part of the country where my family is from, uh, in Mi'kma'ki in northern New Brunswick. Um, and I think most of them are in, muse uh, sorry, um, university collections. So I actually don't really know but I agree. I mean, I, th I think it would be really interesting to have them framed in, in an indigenous way, but that's so rare in Canada. Like, you know, the museums very um, in Canada tend to undervalue their indigenous collections, which, which I find remarkable. You know, there's a national museum of the American Indian here in the States, but Canada doesn't have any such equivalent. And as a result, a lot of, uh, a lot of collections are undervalued or dispersed or, or whatever, and obviously there are individual nations museums, which would be the, the you know the number one solution. But there's just a lack of, of funds for that, fortunately. Thank you. Uh, a question from uh, David Hansen here, Robbie. Thank you for the rich for a rich and challenging paper. One of the issues for museum collections in Australia, which still hold First Nations human remains, is that such was the prodigality of theft and collection in the 19th century, there is occasional difficulty in locating source communities. In one museum where David worked, for example, there was a skull simply labelled Queensland um, with no greater geographical or tribal specificity. I'm sure the same difficulties apply in relation to new world human remains in Europe. Do you have any view on how we might deal with this problem? Yeah, um... I mean, I'm trying to sort of navigate that. Um, it is, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to know when there's nobody um, to claim the ancestor, obviously. So, um, I mean, I'm aware of uh, some Lenape remains in New Jersey that are in a very similar situation where they've actually been repatriated to, to nations that don't really know what to do with them now because they're not, they don't know who they are. Um, so, you know, I mean, I guess, again, uh, you know, I, I, my answer typically is just to, to consult the Indigenous communities that are sort of closest to it. But yeah, of course, it's, um, it's difficult when, when there is nobody that knows that they can claim it. Yeah, this Thanks. is a very, a very vexed issue. Um, yeah. And one that's not easily answered, I suppose, because of all of these complexities and obviously differences, I, I imagine, across the globe as well and different uh, attitudes in both uh, Indigenous communities, but also uh, in museums. Um, we do and, have... And, and, sorry, please. Sorry, sorry. I was going to say, but even like even within 
the indigenous world, there's a lot of different um, opinions about things, you know, like if somebody is a Medeoan, an Ashnabe, um that follows the Medeoan faith, you know, they want kind of like everything returned and then buried, every object to be returned and buried. So, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of variety and then you can only sort of, it does ultimately seem to have to come down to the culture which sort of generated it from which it was stolen. Yeah, I mean, we do have some time for some more questions, but I might uh, take the liberty of asking you a question, if I may, Robbie. I was so interested in what you were saying about uh, particularly the kind of the souls of the utensils, and I was interested in that relationship. It, it had these theoretical implications for me. The souls that are attached, if I understand your argument correctly, to utensils are those that they're, they're sort of a part, if you like, of, uh, of the soul of the person who once held that object or once owned that object or used that object. And that seems to have something really interesting uh, to say in terms of material culture studies and theory about the agency of objects and the kind of agency that objects can accrue through a sort of life. That's uh, something, this is a topic I'm very interested in. And I, I have to confess, I'm interested in this, particularly in my work on medals and my work on medals that were gifted to First Nations people. Uh, many of those medals were buried and then later stolen <laughs> back by collectors. So, yeah, I, I've been very interested in that in that idea. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more on that. Can you can you see your argument? You've you've given it very specifically in relation to the copper kettles, which is works really really well. Are there other objects, uh, other European objects that that argument might transfer onto? And and can you does this have any kind of theoretical implications for your broader project when thinking about indigenous cultural agency? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um... Um, I appreciate that. I'm glad it was uh, of, of interest. And that, it sounds like that is a great connection between those two as well with the metals. But um, yeah, like, well, in my, um, some of the other chapters I look at, uh, which is partly work that I've um, sort of published elsewhere, but I'm expanding on, I, I write about, um, you know, wampum that was manufactured by Europeans, and tomahawks and scalping knives that were manufactured in Britain, and then you know, sort of circulated and then would eventually become museum objects again. Um, so yeah, there, but it's interesting to me uh, looking at it from the lens of um, sort of an Algonquian lens uh, and specifically Mi'kmaq uh, and then the sort of broader nations within the Wabanaki, this, this, this idea of, of Mendu, right? Like this idea of these objects having this sort of spirited energy that we all possess and the kinds of uh, relationality that that produces. Um, and it's really interesting to think about that period of time um, and the sort of the mass production of all these objects, but each possessing this kind of agency and circulating all throughout. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that, that, that does kind of appear throughout uh, this, this project for sure. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a lot more to think and, and say about it, definitely. But it's, it's, I always found it so interesting that, that um, you know, the spectator essay was just, it's kind of not really a very well known name. I mean, maybe it's not very good, I don't know. But, uh, but it's interesting that, um, that it's taken to, uh, to be uh, directly addressing Barclay and, and sort of, you know, souls and stuff like that. But actually, he's, he's actually taking it from this sort of indigenous practice. So that, that story in and of itself, like those objects, kind of accrues its own agency and then sort of circulates. Yeah, I yeah. love that. That's a that's a really powerful way of reinserting First Nations voices back into that narrative. It's really brilliant. Thanks, yeah. Bobby. We've got oh questions are pouring in now, so we've got a couple more oh. to ask. <laughs> <laughs> we've got um, one from Gillian Russell. Uh, Gillian says, "I'm wondering about how the circulation of bones was different from other forms of collecting, in so far uh, that it's uh, dependent on labeling, identification, docketing. Uh, the collector owns the naming of the object." Did that enhance the power or pleasure in collecting and circulation? Uh, for example, the bank's Blumenbach network, and this relates, uh, Gillian says, to David's question. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, um, the sort of the connoiss connoisseurship of the bone, you know, um, and that that's kind of, you know, it's kind of grim, but, but I think that that's definitely true. Um, and obviously, I mean, Blumenbach, you know, sort of, you can read his enthusiasm in his works for, for collecting these things. You know, he's obsessed and he lists them and, 
actually it's that that image i showed of um of the inuit from 1773 that one drawing of the two of the the woman and the man i think it's one of the most beautiful drawings of an indigenous people from the 18th century by nathaniel dance because there's such a powerful kind of life to them you can kind of get a real sense especially Kovic the woman um, and Blumenbach got copies of those and displayed them alongside the skulls he was sort of thrilled to, to kind of have this which I just find found so kind of perverse and horrific in reading and incidentally this is kind of an aside but like I don't know how he got the skull of Kovic because she died of smallpox back in Labrador mm. so Either it's mislabeled or, as as we know Banks was capable of doing, he sent somebody, because they did find her body, and then somebody would have collected her skull from there. So it's just, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, it's, it's bleak, but, um, yeah. Deeply dehumanizing, very distressing. <laughs> yes, um, yes. We have a comment from Gilda. Um, Childa says, uh, in some Indigenous Australian contexts, there's also the soul uh, essences of the tree, which objects are made from, uh, the animals which objects were used with, and the plants which the fibres, uh, from which, you know, fibres were used, etc. The soul comes through the kinship relationships people have with all living things. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, in, in this Mindu idea of the Mindu in, in Nyingma culture, like, if you if you killed a moose, you would offer it tobacco and you would blow the smoke into its lungs. You know, these kinds of it's the sort of connect, connect all beings. And then that connects you with the air and the, the tobacco itself and fire and all these elements. So, yeah, relationality is kind of embedded in all these senses of soul. Thank you. Yeah, great, great observation there from Gilda. Uh, we have another question from uh, Kimberly Takahata. Robbie, Kimberly says, Robbie, thank you very much for sharing this work. I was struck by your point regarding the kettles, um, that those who buried the dead sought to exclude colonists and thus protect their relations. Are there other moments where we can see the dead uh, protecting the living or conversely, ways in which indigenous persons strategically navigated colonial vocabulary to protect their dead further? Hmm. further relations from what I said, I'm, I, I'm not really sure, I guess. Um, I mean, it, it, it's always, it's, a, it's always embedded, not just, I'm oh, sorry, my, my light's gone out. <laughs> um, not, not only in material practice, but in language. So like, you know, in certain indigenous languages, uh, the sense of, um, futurity in the past never goes further back than three generations, right? So, so the ancestors are only ever, or sorry, three days. So the ancestors are only ever three days away. When, like the past is only three days back, the future is only three days forward. Um, so that kind of is a way of, of keeping the ancestors sort of present at all times. But uh, sorry, I'm kind of rambling. I'm not really sure. Where to, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll have to think about that one. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, a com comment from David Hansen, a uh, follow-up comment. Um, for Robbie, re in uh, relation to cultural intersection, the adoption and symbolic modification of settler things by First Nations people. Uh, he has here a citation, Robert Kenny's The Land Enters, The Dreaming, um, Nathaniel Pepper and The Ruptured World from 2010. And it looks oh. um, in a very interesting way at Aboriginal readings and symbolic uses of settler livestock, um, of sheep in this instance. So a good citation right. there for you. Um, thank you, David. Thank uh, you. We have a question now from Monique Rooney. Uh, Monique says, I wonder whether you might comment on how you see the bleak or grim necropolitics of the collector more generally. How to think about it. I'm thinking about the theoretical orientation of your work with reference to Benjamin, uh, but also about the collection as something that might be oriented towards posterity, that is to viewers who exist beyond the life of the collector. Uh, and uh, is the uh, brackets post enlightenment collector invested in the posterity immortal or immortality of their collection? Yeah, um, yeah, those are definitely very central ideas, I think, to, to what I'm sort of trying to get at, for sure. Um, 
you know, a lot of it, this project was inspired by um, the times, you know, I lived in London for, for eight years until quite recently. And whenever uh, my indigenous friends or family would, would visit, I'd take them to various collections of indigenous objects. And uh, I remember one time taking a friend of mine from Winnipeg who was on a Shinabe and he was just like, God, this, this room feels like, like, like a graveyard, you know? Um, and so I just sort of started thinking about the sort of collecting itself as this kind of, um, yeah, the sort of eternal life for the collector and eternal death for indigenous people. So that kind of, um, that sort of, that kind of relationality, I guess, is something else that, that I've been thinking about. Um, and the kind of sort of power dynamics that are invested in that kind of collecting, obviously most manifest in, in the body, in bones, um, in death. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely more there to think about too. Thanks, that's a great question. Robbie, you've been incredibly generous answering all of these very difficult questions. And I think many of these things are more ongoing conversations and things that can have a, a clear answer, obviously, and things that we will all need to work towards understanding collectively. I'd like to, on behalf of the Centre for Early Modern Studies, the Australian National University, I want to send our very, very um, most heartfelt thanks for a wonderful paper, which has really done credit to our burgeoning new series. And um, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of the attendees today when I say um, thank you for a powerful, moving and, diff and addressing a difficult subject that, that really needs to be aired. Um, it really is now that um, a few people are saying thanks in the Q&A, but uh, I, I do hope to extend uh, an invitation to bring you to Australia, as I said privately before, and I really hope that we can see you and hear more of your work in context. And I know that uh, colleagues from ANU who have been answering questions would be really delighted to have you with us too. So thank you once again, Robbie, for a very generous and wonderful talk and for taking time out of your evening with the time difference over there <laughs> in uh, the States. And we look forward, I hope, to seeing you again very soon. So, th so thank you very much, Robbie. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the great questions as well.